The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, buried alive behind bars. You hear people screaming all night, and that's all I used to think about. We're in hell. Sentenced to life at the age of 28. And I realized, hey, I'm never going home. And I just... For a nonviolent, low-level crime. Life for nothing. A victim of the federal three strikes law. That that sheet of paper meant that you had to receive a mandatory life sentence without parole. And the crusader who fought to set him free on today's 700 Club. So take you going home. <laughs> I just started crying. We're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave. Welcome to the 700 Club. Sizzling temperatures are frying the Northeast with extreme triple digit heat indexes from Maine to Florida. In some locations, it will feel as hot as 110 degrees. Is there any relief in sight? We hope so. John Jessup has more. Pat, temperatures are higher than normal for this time of the year. The heat index already topping 100 deg degrees in the mid-Atlantic and northeast. It's hit cities like Philadelphia particularly hard. Game plan today was to start out early so we could beat some of the heat, which we really didn't because it's still already hot already. It's extremely hot. It's definitely hotter than it usually is right now. And that's nothing compared to tomorrow. Pat, down in your part of the country, it's expected to feel like 109 degrees. Later in the week, the southwest is also going to feel extreme heat, with temperatures also reaching triple digits. Well, overnight, Israel struck Iranian-backed military positions in Syria. And inside Iran, mysterious fires and explosions are landing blows to its nuclear program. The regime is also fighting the rise of COVID-19. So why is the virus being called a pandemic of hope? CBN's George Thomas explains. Whether it's the exploding coronavirus, mysterious fires at nuclear and military facilities, or protests, Iran's ruling Islamic clerics are facing unprecedented challenges as the regime tries to maintain an iron grip on the nation. On Monday, the government executed a man it convicted of spying for the CIA and Israeli intelligence. Mahmoud Musavi Majid received that sentence for allegedly passing information to the CIA about the whereabouts of General Qassam Soleimani. The powerful leader was killed in a U.S. drone strike earlier this year. This is a regime that's facing really uh, a possible rebellion in the near future. Regime officials talk about it, and so they're executing a lot of people to put fear into the public. The execution follows a string of mysterious fires and explosions around the country. On Sunday, fires broke out at a military installation near Tehran, a shipyard in Boucher, and a key power plant connected to Iran's Natanz nuclear facility in Isfahan. Similar incidents have happened across Iran since June. This cannot be a coincidence. This cannot be uh, just uh, a series of, of accidents that without malicious intent from someone. Some pointing to Israel's ongoing overt and at times covert war against the Islamic Republic. Israel specifically is trying to stop the transfer of very advanced, precise munitions to the regime's proxies like Hezbollah, and also wants to slow down the Iranian nuclear program. This, as President Trump reportedly gives the CIA green light to launch more offensive cyber attacks to cripple or destroy some of Iran's critical infrastructures. All this against the backdrop of ongoing government protests and a remarkable revival that's witnessing thousands of Muslims turning to Christianity in the midst of COVID-19. That's why we call this a pandemic of hope. Mike Ansari runs Mohabbat TV, one of the most popular Christian satellite channels in Iran. The ministry reports it is recording 10 times more online salvations than this time last year. We're registering around 3,000 professional decisions, personal decisions by Iranian Muslims. 
to leave Islam for Christianity during this revival. Ansari says that's 3,000 people each month who've decided to follow Jesus Christ since the pandemic began in March. People in Iran are just not happy the way uh, their economy is going, the way uh, the government is uh, robbing them uh, of their natural resources and exporting Shiite Islam to the neighboring countries. Um, so they just don't trust their government. The large number of people leaving Islam is causing a backlash against the church. Dozens of Christians have also been arrested and imprisoned for responding to the gospel message since March. During these critical times for the regime, uh, there's a tendency historically for the regime to really crack down on religious uh, communities like Christian commerce, and we see that today. Iran is one of the world's most dangerous places for Christians, yet Christianity is growing faster in Iran than in any other country in the world. George Thomas, CBN News. Thanks, George. Pat, 3,000 Christian conversions a month, that's remarkable. It's amazing, but listen, those people are hungry to know freedom. They have been under the control of this uh, group of ayatollahs. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> an extreme Islamic dictatorship, a theocracy, and the people of Iran are sick of it. They are sick of the controls. They're sick of the Islamic uh, terror that's been waged upon them. You know, during the Obama administration, there were demonstrations but we did nothing about it. Right now, Mike Pompeo, is, and along with President Trump, are saying, we're going to help you with cyber attack uh, f to support these people. They took out Soleimani, who was head of that Quds force, and he was just one of many. But those leaders understand the people hate them. They do not want it anymore, and we have to recognize the Iranian people are different from the leadership. So when we deal with Iran, we cannot hurt the people who are pro-America, pro-freedom, and are seeking better ways, and they want to be out of this extreme Islamic terrorism. But whatever we can do, we, we sooner or later, we need to not only send uh, cyber attacks, but it looks like we need to surreptitiously get some arms to these people because the rule of the mullahs may be coming to an end in Iraq. It, it is a, I mean, in Iran, it is a wonderful thing. And uh, they have been uh, an area that is dangerous. They, they, they believe in this uh, Mahdi, the uh, Ayatollah, uh, the supreme Mahdi. And they also believe in a version of the, of, uh, of, uh, Islam that indicates there will be one final battle between good and evil, and the Mahdi will come at the end of a great dis uh, you know, uh, disturbance and then bring peace. That's what they believe, and, and the thing is, we need to be aware of their deeply held beliefs of the leadership and do everything we can to undermine that, to let the freedom come forth in that country. But Extreme Islam, according to them, indicates there's going to be a major catastrophe. So they didn't hesitate. They wouldn't hesitate to have a, an atomic war that kills millions of people as long as the Mahdi would uh, triumph. We cannot allow that to happen. So keep in mind the religion of that people, of the leadership, and realize the people of Iran want freedom, and we'll do everything we can to encourage freedom. And that, in my opinion, not only cyber, but we need to be sending some kind of arms. If we knew the leadership and we could help them, perhaps surreptitiously, we could get something into their hands that would give them some power against that vicious, awful uh, leadership that is running the country right now. John. Pat, back here at home, President Trump says he plans to send more federal law enforcement officers into democratically run cities facing unrest. The move follows his deployment of agents to Portland earlier this month. The state's most populous city has experienced more than seven weeks of protests and violence, but city and state officials say they don't want federal agents there, adding that they're making the problem worse. Conservative leaders say city officials are allowing the problems to get out of control. How about Chicago? 
I read the numbers were many people killed over the weekend. We're looking at Chicago, too. We're looking at New York. Look at what's going on. All run by Democrats, all run by very liberal Democrats, all run really by radical left. But we can't let this happen to the cities. New York was up 348 percent, the crime wave. The New York Daily News reports gun violence and murders have spiked across the country, even, Pat, as the number of arrests have plunged. Well, de Blasio in New York, you cannot believe the statement that it's, it's the most peaceful it's been. And they are having killings and riots. He wants to take a billion dollars away from the police department and give it to some uh, agency that his wife uh, has been in charge of. It's just unbelievable in New York. But uh, in Chicago, the police are actually asking the federal government to come in. Uh, in Portland, they're saying stay away, but at the same time, uh, there's a violation of federal law and federal agents can come in uh, because there's a shared uh, uh, situation where the, the local law and the federal law overlap and the federal law takes precedence. And so we need to get in there and do this stuff but now we understand a lot of young people are involved. It's not just Antifa, it's not just Black Lives Matter, but it's also uh, a group of kids, uh, I mean, you know, whatever you call them, millennials, who are, they just are intent on destroying things. And there needs to be some penalty to those people. They need to understand they can't just be having a lark and tear stuff down without any consequence. We need to go after it big time. And I, I, I've been reading a book about, about uh, Grant. That he was facing the Ku Klux Klan in the South after the Civil War. And he sent a division of troops uh, into that area to settle it. And he, they were very successful. But until that time, the Klan was just beating on people. They were killing people. And they were running amok. We cannot allow that to happen. Now, let's take a look now at Seattle because there's a case there that John wants to talk about. That's right, Pat. In Seattle, a mother is suing the city after her son was shot to death in the former so-called CHOP Autonomous Zone. Protesters took over the six-block area for several weeks in June after police pulled out. Police eventually reclaimed the area, but according to CBN contributor Chuck Holton, who recently traveled to the region, there are signs that business owners still fear attacks. So this is the former Chaz Chop Zone of downtown Seattle, and we're just walking around here, kind of looking at the aftermath. And one of the things that I notice is that on just about every shop that is open, they have signs in the window that say something like Black Lives Matter, uh, they support the gay agenda, uh, all cops are bad, uh, something along those lines. And it's almost like it's a desperate plea, please don't ransack my store. And I would say that probably the majority of the people who have shops in this area, live in this area, most likely agree with the leftist agenda, the socialist agenda of the protesters and the rioters. But even still, they feel the need to beg people not to destroy their store. And they do that by saying, we're one of you, and putting signs all over the place that say we support your agenda. That was CBN contributor Chuck Holton reporting from Seattle. The National Institutes of Health director, Dr. Francis Collins, says we could have as many as not one, not two, but three vaccines by the end of the year. The latest good news, researchers at Oxford University say a vaccine in trials appears to be safe and effective. Not only does it activate antibodies that keep the virus from spreading, it also boosts white blood cells that fight it. The potential vaccine is in phase three trials now, and the government has already ordered 300 million doses. We feel that there's urgency and pressure really every day. So people are working day and night, they're working weekends, and we're not going to stop till we get an answer. At least 40 states are seeing increases in new cases, with more people being hospitalized in 39 states. In the hot zone of Houston, Texas health officials say the number of people being admitted, Pat, appears to be slowing down, and that, of course, is good news. Well, anything is good news, but it, it does seem that the number of cases, the weather channel is starting to report in our area, where I live in, here, we didn't think there was much danger, and now, lo and behold, there are several thousand cases springing up in Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Portsmouth, this is Chesapeake. Um, 
So uh, it, it does kill people, but those apparently who have the metabolic stem syndrome are the most vulnerable, those who are already overweight or out of shape or have some uh, underlying condition. Underlying some kind, condition, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's terrible. Uh, it, it's just deadly what's happening. And uh, I, I'm all for this wearing masks. We've, we've got to do what we can uh, to prevent the spread of this terrible disease. Terry. Well, coming up later, a woman from Kenya living in Texas gets a supernatural healing from Virginia Beach. How is that possible? Stay tuned to find out. But first, like being buried alive, that's how one prisoner described his life sentence. His crime? A nonviolent drug offense. A victim of the federal three strikes law speaks out after this. nation of criminals. We have more people in the United States incarcerated than any other nation on the face of the earth. We have, we were counting and we lost track when we got to 300,000 offenses that are, will bring criminal sanctions to them. We don't even know how many laws we've got. And people in the government were running on hard on crime. And then they passed something called the Three Strikes Law. Nonviolent. You sell a quarter of an ounce of cocaine or marijuana, and that's strike one. You sell another one or two ounces, that's strike two. You somehow get involved in, in something and where you're charged whether you did it or not, and you strike three, and you now have a sentence for the rest of your life. It is insane what we have done, but we have done it. And these politicians saying, I'm going to stand up. I'm tough on crime. That's not the way to stop crime, but that's what they did. Well, one man said, it's like being buried alive. That's how one federal inmate described his life sentence. He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a child molester. He was 28 years old and had never been convicted of a violent crime. So how in the world did he get locked up for the rest of his life? Caitlin Burke explains how this is another reason the U.S. has become a nation of criminals. But it's like hell, like how they describe hell. Nobody can hear you screaming, hear your screams. That's really how it is, I mean, hear people screaming all night. That's all I used to think about. We're in hell. At the age of 28, a judge sentenced Herman Tate to life in prison without parole for a low-level, nonviolent drug offense. Buried a lot. Mm -hmm. Just imagine it, putting you in a cast and you're alive. But you can stand up and walk around in it. Just, that's what it is. You can't get out. Tate's sentence fell under the federal three strikes drug law passed by Congress in the 1980s. It states that if someone is charged with a federal drug crime and already has two prior drug offenses, then that's the third strike. And a federal prosecutor can require the judge to impose a mandatory life sentence. Tate's first strike came in 1992 for selling half a gram of crack. His sentence, six months probation. He gained his second strike two years later. That time, he sold 7.7 .7 grams of cocaine. Sentenced to five years in prison, Tate was only required to serve eight months. Then, in 1998, he struck out, charged with conspiracy to sell cocaine. Tate, however, had never heard of the three strikes drug law, and since no drugs were found in his possession, he chose to go to trial. The prosecutor filed what's known as an 851 notice. That means that even if the judge uh, wanted to take pity on you, even if the judge believed that you could be rehabilitated, even if the judge believed that the sentence was too harsh, that that sheet of paper meant that you had to receive a mandatory life sentence without parole. Mm, life. Wow. For nothing. Tate headed to federal prison, where it took two years for the gravity of his sentence to sink in. I keep seeing people going home, and I'm like, man. And I realize, hey, I'm never going home. And I just, I 
And it just hit me all of a sudden. And that's when I realized that I had a life sentence in the federal system. The three strikes federal drug law covers all 50 states. Many states have gone further, expanding three strikes laws that impose mandatory life sentences for three convictions of certain felonies. In California, for example, the 1994 Three Strikes You're Out law was designed to keep murderers, rapists, and child molesters behind bars. Today, however, more than half sentenced under that law are serving life sentences for nonviolent crimes. Evidence that these three strikes laws can result in unintended consequences. My Angel Cody is an attorney and the director of the Decarceration Collective, a team of women fighting to free people sentenced to life in prison for drugs and end the policies that put them there. Many of her clients were teenagers or young adults when convicted with their third strike. The mandatory life sentence that followed, basically erasing the possibility of maturation and growth, stamping them instead as irredeemable. The most potent example of sort of the human spirit, right, is that we tell someone you're buried alive and you're never going to leave prison. And for the person to still have the audacity and the wherewithal to get up every day and to, to try to make some meaning of your life, I think is... Um, it, for me, it's deeply inspiring. It's why I do the work. Um, it also is the most salient example of why we ought to go back and look at these different laws. When Congress passed the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010, it provided the potential for a lower sentence, but did nothing for those already in prison. Then in 2018, President Trump signed the First Step Act, which finally allowed the opportunity to reconsider prior sentences. In reading the new law, Tate regained a sense of hope for the first time in nearly 22 years. And I'm like, oh, Lord, because it fit me. I fit the criteria. Cody and her team officially requested his life sentence be reduced. This past January, Tate learned of his freedom. I'm just watching the TV, and my case manager come out and called my name, Tate, Tate. Took my earbuds out. I'm like, yeah, what's up? She's like, you need to come to my office right now. I'm like, oh. So I go over there, and she turns around with a big smile on her face. I'm like, what's wrong with you? She said, Tate, you going home. <laughs> I just started crying. I said, don't play. She said, I'm for real. I said, don't lie to me. And that's when I found out. Still, an estimated 800 inmates could likely die in prison under the three strikes drug law. A disproportionate number of them are black. There are all these places along the highway towards imprisonment where people get off, right? And then there are on-ramps. And what we've seen is that disproportionately, it's more difficult for African-Americans to exit off of that highway, right? And that more of them are on that highway towards mass incarceration and imprisonment. Some of that relates to charging decisions that are made. Some of that relates to the rates of uh, arrest. Some of it relates to community um, resources that are available. No legislation reforming the federal three strikes drug law includes those sentenced to life for marijuana convictions. But Cody believes change is coming. I absolutely believe that um, transformative justice will occur. And the reason why is because I think that people are awake and paying attention. Cody says now is the time for the American people to ask questions and put pressure on our elected officials. That's because voters can make a major impact at the ballot box and be the catalyst that keeps Cody's clients and many others from being buried alive behind bars. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, I want you to say that uh, I, I went to the Center for Constitutional Law at Regent University talked to the dean, who is a former chief judge. He said, I'm an expert on this matter, and we've got other people that are. We have experienced it because we know firsthand what these laws do. There are hundreds of thousands of offenses that have been put into the laws by federal agencies that were not put in by Congress. And we're looking at the possibility of a major overhaul in the criminal justice system. 
because we the the cost is incredible. But you've got some young person. He's say he's 17 years old. His brain hadn't completely formed. He doesn't quite know the difference between right and wrong. So he goes out on a joy ride, and the next thing you know, he's he's in jail for five years. And then when he comes out, he has a criminal conviction. And so he's stigmatized for the rest of his life. We've got to do something about that. But especially these federal agencies that have passed these rules that have sanctions, criminal sanctions attached to them. Something has got to be done. And I think the president on that case, by a stroke of the pen, could eliminate a whole lot of this. And the cost in human life is incalculable. But the cost in money is huge. We have to build prisons. And now we understand that many of the prisons are being farmed out to private corporations who are guaranteed like 80% occupancy of the prisons. So they have a financial incentive to keep people in jail and to fill them up. I mean, this is a horrible system we've got. And this is the land of the free, the home of the brave. And yet we have more people incarcerated than communist China or communist Russia or communist any other country, you North Korea, whatever. I mean, this is terrible. And we've got to do something about it. So as I want you to know, the Center for Law and Justice at the uh, Constitutional Law at the Regent University is working on this. We'd like to bring forth comprehensive legislation that did away with hundreds of these offenses, the nonviolent offenses that are putting people behind bars and ruining their lives for the rest of, the, of, of their time and costing us billions and billions of dollars unnecessarily. Terry? Well, still ahead on today's program, the hundredfold return. Do you know what it is? Meet a lady who experienced it firsthand when her crazy business idea took off like a shot. That's coming up. But first, a relentless rash with a searing itch. It was slowly taking over this woman's body. Doctors couldn't help her. So how did she get healed without ever leaving her home? You'll find out. Plus, we're going to be praying for you and your needs after this. Isabella was beside herself. Nothing she tried could stop the itchy rash that was slowly creeping over her body. Even her doctor couldn't help her. Then one day, her husband pointed her to something that led Isabella to a cure right in her own home. My name is Isabella, and I'm originally from Kenya. And right now, we are empty nesters, so it's just me and my husband. For leisure, I do have a little garden that me and my husband put together. It was around June 2019. When I noticed that I was really having an issue and I started having each and feeling like I needed to scratch. It was a reddish rash, itchy, and it kept looking like it was moving up and down on both sides. And then it got to a point now it was on the side of my breast. So painful. I would go to work and leave my desk just to go to the bathroom, just to rub on it. What is this now? But the hydrocortisone that normally helps would not help. That's when I started going to see the doctor. Well, all she told me, I want you to use this cream. Come back in three weeks to see me. I did use it for three weeks. I went back and I told her I don't see any improvement. And I looked at myself in the mirror. And I said, this thing is not going away. I'm a believer too. I'm on a women uh, prayer ministry. And you know, you can pray for other people and they get a breakthrough. But I've been always asking my other sisters on our ministry, I've been praying for certain things, but I don't get to see any breakthrough. <laughs> and they tell me, but calm down, your time will come. I was watching the 700 Club with my husband after he had mentioned to me that he had watched it two days earlier. 
and was impressed with the program. And after a few minutes, Terry, she said, Yes, yeah, someone else, you have an inexplicable rash that's been spreading on your body. It's not, you've been to the doctor, it's not any known disease. It just hasn't been able to be addressed. God's doing that for you right now. It's just going to begin to disappear and be gone in Jesus' name. And I said, she is talking about me and I'm going to take it. I receive it, I'm going to be well. But you know, in my natural sense also, I'm like, okay, when will tomorrow get here? So I went, when we went to sleep that night. Yes, the next day I took a shower. I didn't have the redness. I dressed up, got ready to go to work. I had no redness. The next day, it didn't take 24 hours. It was less than 24 hours. <laughs> I believe anything is possible. I don't have the problem that I had anymore. And I'm enjoying watching the 700 Club every day. There is no distance in prayer. As much as Terry and Pat were not actually in my living room, they're, they said they're in Virginia and I'm here in Texas and they were able to pray for me. It was a healing breakthrough. And it came at a time when I really needed it. Oh, Isabella, we rejoice with you in that healing. That is wonderful. You know, God knows your name. He knows your need. He knows where you are. We don't have to be sitting next to you for God to touch you right at your place of need. And so we want to, We believe in the power of prayer. We believe that God is who He says He is, the Lord, our healer. So today we want to take some time to pray for you. I know many of you have needs and, you know, some of your needs are physical, like Isabella's were. Some of you have financial needs. Some of you have uh, serious, serious health needs. Some have relationship needs, but God That's knows right. it all That's right. and can you, do it you all. Some answers I you do. This is, this is months ago. Ty of Douglasville, Pennsylvania, seriously injured his right shoulder. He suffered a partial tear to his rotator cuff and a torn ligament on his clavicle, and he couldn't use his right arm. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, his doctor could not do surgery for him. On April 21st of this year, Pat, Ty was watching this program and he heard you say, someone put your hand on your right shoulder. You dislocated your right shoulder, pulled a muscle, whatever it is, just touch it now and it will go back in place and the pain will be taken away. So Ty prayed with you. He had full movement of his arm restored and he is pain free. Praise God. And here's somebody uh, Richard, who lived in Linwood, Washington, had significant throat issues. When drinking water was difficult, he couldn't speak clearly. He was watching our program June 16th of this year, just a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, when he heard you say you have swelling in your throat, you have trouble swallowing, even trouble eating. God's healing you, and guess what? Richard said that's for me, and was wow. immediately healed. Now, Terry and I want to pray for you. There's nothing impossible for God. With men, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Now, some of you have trouble in your family. You, you have a rebellious child. You don't know what to do with them. You, some of you are suffering from financial burden. The uh, corona thing has really upset you. You may be at the end of your uh, life or your business, and you, you feel despairing. God is able. He said, the gold is mine, the silver is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all his. And he is God of glory. And he can ask, he could just speak a word and it'll be to you. Now we're going to join hands together and we're going to pray for you. And we're asking you, just believe God right now. Take away all of your doubt just for this time and say, I believe God with you. Father, we, we join together in prayer and we believe in the power of God. There's somebody else, we've had that word, but there's somebody has a choking right now. I think it's a thyroid condition that's pressing in on your, your, your windpipe. And the, whether it's a goiter or whatever, you just put your hand on it in the name of Jesus, it shall be healed. Touch, Terry. Yeah, I don't know if this is connected to that or not, but you have a problem with your salivary glands. It's just, it's like they're out of control or something, and they keep producing this sweet, 
tasting saliva that just affects how food tastes, how you eat. God is healing that for you right now in Jesus' name. Despair. Uh, Marcy, you, you've got despair. You just, in, in, you just, you say, I, I'm despairing. I, I, I just have no hope. My life has ended. And God is going to lift you. He's going to give you hope. In the name of Jesus, you'll feel your life being filled with hope right now in Jesus' name. Terry. Now, there's someone else who's, um, you're, you're not American by birth, but you're in this country, and you have a lot of fear about your future and your current situation. God is opening doors for you and making a way for you in ways you cannot see right now, but rest in Him, trust Him. It is being done for you in Jesus' name. There's somebody, I believe the name is Thomas. You need $100,000, and you've been crying out to God because it looks like you're going to lose everything you've got because of what's happening. And right now, God has heard your prayer, and he's going to open the windows of heaven, and he's going to pour you out such a blessing you can't receive it. So just receive now in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, for all those watching this program, let the power of God come into their lives. Lord, Grant the desire of their heart. You said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive. So we ask now for those in this audience, grant them, Lord, the desire of their heart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Please give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. It's 1-800-700-7000. If you need further prayer, somebody's here for you. Pick up the phone, 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions. Pam wants to know, after death, how long before a Christian gets a new body? Your questions and some honest answers waiting in the wings. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. As society and culture appear to be growing more secularized, many across the globe still say religion is important and that God plays a major role in their lives. That's according to a new worldwide study from the Pew Research Center, which surveyed people in 34 countries on their beliefs as well as the importance of God, prayer, and religion in their lives. It found, though, a global divide among nations over how important aspects of faith are and whether belief in God is necessary to lead a moral life. Well, a member of the first family helped to serve some in the nation's capital hit hard by the pandemic. Ivanka Trump volunteered at the faith-based D.C. Dream Center to distribute food to underserved communities impacted by COVID-19. The first daughter and White House advisor helped load fresh produce, milk, and meat into 500 boxes. She was joined by city and church leaders, including Pastor Paula White. The families have never received this quality of food. And if you could see the smiles, the tears, the testimonies, it makes a world of difference. The Farmers to Family Food Box program announced it just reached 5 million boxes distributed for families affected by the pandemic. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. It was said by somebody they were praying for money, and uh, the prayer went to heaven, and St. Peter looked around and couldn't find any money, but there were a lot of good ideas up there. So <laughs> that, that's sort of a joke, but nevertheless, Becky Harmon had one of those ideas that must have come from the Lord. She thought it was a crazy business. Turned out it was a huge success. The business also led Becky to receive a 100-fold return. Take a look. Becky Harmon is a pioneer in the field of home staging and redesign. She's learned that when you do what you love, work hard, and give generously, God takes care of the rest. He will give you a sense, a desire, a stirring. And if you take one step towards what God is leading you to, he will show you the next step. After becoming Christians early in their marriage, Becky and her husband Chips began to learn what the Bible says about finances. We learned about giving just from uh, our church, from studying the Bible, and from hearing teachings on CBN. 
I felt like CBN was a friend. It was sound and, and wise, and Pat Robertson just instilled a sense of confidence. They began tithing regularly to their church and giving to CBN. And I remember hearing um, a lesson about God doing the hundredfold return. It was six months later, um, I had an idea for a crazy business, and it was a balloon bouquet delivery business in the day before anybody was doing that. The business was an instant success. Our tax person came to me and, and said, you girls made almost exactly $50,000 your first year. And then it came back to me that that was the return of the $500 hundredfold return. Becky later sold her business for a profit. Soon after, a real estate agent asked Becky to stage a house that had been on the market for months. She agreed. It sold within days. It was just an immediate success. And we've increased in income about 30% a year. God just keeps growing it and blessing it. Becky says obeying God is the key to a successful life. We don't have to ask the question, should we give to God this week? Because it's a blessing to do that. God always finds creative ways to bring it back to you. It's fun, it's exciting, it's an adventure. She's got it right, you know, giving is fun. It's really fun. It really, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's true. There's a lot of fun, but it's fun also when you realize that God's going to put something at the end of it, that you're not just giving money away, that it's going to come back to you many fold over. Terry? Well, coming up, your questions and Pat's honest answers. Linda says, do you think Christians should wear masks in church? What do you think Pat will say to that? You'll find out after this. Join the Superbook Club and watch the stories of the Bible come to life for you and your children. If you join today, we're going to send you three DVDs of our newest episode, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. Plus, you'll receive the Summer of Miracles bonus pack with three additional episodes, Roar, the story of Daniel and the lion's den, Miracles of Jesus, and Noah and the Ark. So that's six DVDs for $25. And that's not all. Superbook Club members can stream all episodes from seasons one through five for free. So go to CBN.com or you can call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the Superbook Club. We'll gladly sign you up. Time for some email. You ready? Okay, let's go for them. Right. Okay. This first one comes from Pam who says, after death, how long before a Christian gets a new body? Uh, a long time. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, you know, at the resurrection, we're going to be clothed with a new body uh, that's going to be uh, like nothing we've ever seen before. It'll be a glorious body, and we'll be like Jesus. That's what the Bible says. In the meantime, uh, you know, when he talked to the thief on the cross, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. So the Spirit would leave, and he would be with the Lord. So we are with the Lord. Uh, and. Paul said, whether at home in the body or present with the Lord. So I think we're going to be with the Lord, but what kind of a body we have? I mean, the Bible really is silent on it as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, but at the resurrection, when, at, when the Lord comes back at the final judgment, uh, we will be resurrected. We'll be caught up to be with Him and the Lord in the air, and we'll, we'll be like Him. We'll have a body like His glorious body, all right? This is Linda who says, do you think Christians should wear masks in church? Our church reopened and I was excited to go back, but I noticed the first week that some people weren't wearing, wearing masks. The second week, more people were not wearing masks. I'm over 65 and my husband has serious health issues, so I quit going to church. We live in an area where mask wearing has been mandated in public, but I think churches are exempt. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, I don't think they should be exempt, I think. What's happened is these corona uh, particles linger in the air for quite some while. They are aerosol. They are born in the air, and people can catch them, and they can die because of them. So if you're loving, you're going to wear a mask in the church so you won't... Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't know who's a carrier and who isn't. Exactly. So uh, I, I think definitely people in church should wear masks. They, they, 
you know, there, there's somebody got me some masks that, uh, that N95. It's you know available. You can get them at CBS. And, mm -hmm. you know, oh, there, now you can get, get masks them anywhere. Almost everywhere. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Hey, this is Jerry who says, "Hi, Pat. What is meant by the belt of truth and the spiritual armor spoken of in Ephesians? Is that God's word? And if so, why does it also list the sword as the spirit, which is the word of God, as a piece of the armor? Are both pieces of armor referring to the word of God?" I think the belt of truth truth is your life. Uh, if you're going to go up against the devil, you've got, you cannot have lies in your heart. And you, 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 you're going to fight against the devil, but you internally are, are filled with lies. You can't stand against the devil unless you're honest. You have to be honest. And so your life has to, truth is, is to square up something. I chew up an angle. I'm, I'm, my life is in accordance with the Bible. And uh, so the word of the word of truth is is the Bible itself, obviously. But truth, your loins gird about with truth. That means you cannot be living a lie. All right. This is Sonia who says, "Why can't priests get married?" Uh, you know, I just in case you didn't realize, I'm not the Pope, and I don't set the rules for the Catholic Church. But if you want to know the truth, way way back when. Thousands of, I mean, hundreds of years ago, married people had money and they left their money to their spouses, not to the church. And so it, it, I hate to say it was a little bit having to do with money, but I think that was the case. So they enforced celibacy so they wouldn't be a problem with the, with the inheritance. Yeah. Uh, and. I, I think uh, it's high time for the church to begin to let priests get married because the celibacy uh, enforced is not a good thing. You can be celibate by, by, by your own desire, but uh, I don't think it ought to be enforced upon them. And I, I think the idea of, of a priest having a family is a good thing, but I, I don't set the rules of the Catholic Church. Okay, this is Polly who says, I would like Pat to talk about mediums and spirits. Are they part of the occult and should I handle it when others talk about, how should I handle it when others talk about them? Uh, shall we listen to spirits that peep and mutter? The Bible says it's, it's, it's evil, it's wrong. And these spirits come from the devil. So somebody says, I'm a medium. They're, they're, not, they're not giving you some revelation from Uncle Charlie who died and come back to life and he's translated through them. These mediums are talking demonic, and it's demon-possessed, all right? This is Dana who says, what happens to those souls who believe in Christ and live a life according to God's law, but have not gone through the formality of being saved or haven't necessarily attended church on a routine basis, but still have a strong faith? Is believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior and knowing He's a forgiving God enough to get into heaven? Also, can you be saved after you die? Uh, the answer to the second question is no. Once you're dead, you're dead. I, I don't believe there's a second chance. I mean, God gives you a whole life to make a decision. But what brings about salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. Paul said, God didn't send me out to baptize. He sent me out to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So joining a church or being baptized is you know, some, these important things to help you in the fellowship but they're not critical for your salvation. Your salvation depends on faith in Jesus Christ. Well, today's power minute is from 1 Peter. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Tomorrow we've got our special voicemail edition of the Seven Club. It's always fun to have your questions actually broadcast on this program, and I'll do what I can to try to answer them. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And Lord willing, I will see you tomorrow for our special program on Q&A. <laughs> see you then. Bye-bye.